shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of every lie. There is no escape. Proverbs 19.5 I will tell the truth for Every lie, Proverbs 19:5. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19:5. Okay, I have to interrupt here, Tom, mm -hmm. because I have to tell you, when we read verse 9, I will give you another Bible reference that confirms what is written in verse 9, and that is very important because a lot of people are asking yourself, is Tom just sucking this out of his thumb? Is Tom just making this up? Where is the biblical reference for that the papacy is the Antichrist? Now, let me read to you, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Speaking of that wicked that is uh, revealed in verse 7 and 8. Okay, Even him, verse 9 says, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, how can you know that this is speaking of the papacy and nothing else but the papacy? Well, when you turn to Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, we read, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, great authority. So, it says in verse 9, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And in Revelation 13 we read that this beast, which is speaking of the beast that comes out of the water, out of the sea, which we know is the papacy, has been given power and seat and authority by the dragon. Who is the dragon? Well, we go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, and we read... And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Tom, do you think that this is biblical proof enough that the papacy is the Antichrist when you read these verses uh, oh. Cross read them in, in this understanding. It can speak of nothing but the papacy. There's no other candidate for this man of sin, this son of perdition, this beast, the the little horn of Daniel, the Antichrist of John. There, they can speak of nothing else that has ever existed in the world but the papacy. The papacy is the only candidate that fits. Let me tell you something else about this working of Satan. What is the working of Satan? The Bible Lying, points to the Bible. The, the Bible. Yeah. The, yeah, Bible please, please. the Bible plainly tells us what the working of Satan is. Satan literally stated his working, and it's recorded in the Bible, in Isaiah chapter fourteen, verse twelve through fifteen. Yeah. Here That's is true. the working of Satan from Satan's own mouth. Let me see if I can even just look it up real quick and read it verbatim because I have it. I have it, I have it here, Tom. I'm all just right, opening you, this you, up. All right, you read it now. Now listen, when Yerk reads, this is Satan projecting with his own mouth what his working in the world is. Go, Isaiah chapter fourteen, verse twelve and following. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? 
For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Ends verse 15 of Isaiah chapter okay. 19. Okay, now does that sound anything like what we read right here in Second Thessalonians chapter 2? Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. L listen, let me tell my listeners something. Paul is just restating what Satan said of himself in Isaiah chapter 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High. And you know what God's immediate response was? Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Now, God does not deny that Lucifer will fulfill his false prophecy. And he has, through the man of sin, the son of perdition in Rome, who ex opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, sits in a temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let me just boil it down and make plain, simple sense out of this to your listeners. The papacy is the human agency. Listen, Satan, Lucifer, is a spirit, right? He doesn't have a body. So he needs a body to indwell, doesn't he? If he's going to achieve this, what he has prophesied to do in Isaiah chapter 14. So he must have a body. He must have a visible head to accomplish his, his prophecy. And God does not deny that he's going to do this. He said, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You know when that happens? The second coming of Christ. When Christ visibly appears and sees this human agency through which Satan has achieved his stated goal in Isaiah chapter 14. And you know what's going to happen to that man of sin, that son of perdition, that antichrist? He will be destroyed without hand. He will be destroyed by the brightness of Jesus coming. He will be destroyed by the spirit of Jesus' mouth. Why? Because he is not Jesus Christ's vicar on earth. He's been a lying wonder ever since the beginning. Ever since the beginning, after the Caesars of Rome were the, that were restraining his rise to power were taken out of the way. And as soon as the pagan Roman emperors were taken out of the way, history records without any controversy, without any doubt whatsoever, what power it was that came to power in Rome after the Caesars were, were taken out of the way. And it's the papacy. There's no other candidate. History records it. God prophesied it through Daniel, through Paul, and through John. What does it say? Let everything be established by two or three witnesses. There you have three witnesses. Daniel prophesied this, this, this man of sin. He called him. He called him the little horn. And we have Paul plainly predicting his imminent rise to power after the Caesars were taken out of the way. And we have John the Revelator giving us a detailed, full-color picture of the workings of this man of sin in Rome from beginning to end all throughout the Christian era. Now, do you want to read this history for yourself? Do you not want to take just the mere words of a fallible man by the name of Tom Fress? I encourage you 
not to take me at face value, nor the things I say, but let God reveal it to you through the mouth of another man, more eminent than me, more accomplished than me, more trusted than me. And that is the author, the Christian author, Henry Grattan Guinness, in his book, Romanism and the Reformation. In that book, Henry Grattan Guinness brings us the testimony and the witness of the prophet Daniel about this little horn, this this man of sin, this antichrist, this beast. And then he gives us Paul's additional information about this man of sin, the son of perdition. And then he gives us John's rendition of it. And you'll find through that book, without any shred of doubt, that they're all speaking of the same thing, the papacy. There's not even a remote chance that any other power, any other entity in world history even comes close. Now, let me make perfect sense out of this. We're taught today that God, our Father, finding no other means for saving man from his fall, sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The Father sent his only begotten Son, gave up his most prized possession, his own Son, to pay the price that none of us could pay on our own. The only thing that would satisfy God's justice and redeem us to God is the blood of his own Son. Now, the whole Bible brings prophecy (coughs) of how to determine precisely who that Christ is and exactly when he will come so that no one could be deceived, so that no one could miss his arrival in the world and exactly what he would do, even the very words that he would say on the cross. Every book in the Bible is a testimony, a prediction of of the coming of this great Redeemer. There's nothing left to chance. God wants us. Merciful Father wants us to know who our Redeemer is and exactly how he redeemed us to God so we could all trust in him. Now, what we're taught in the churches today that the very souls for whom God's precious Son bled and died to redeem should not know who this man of sin is who would deceive us all. This Antichrist, that he won't come until the very end, just before Jesus Christ returns, whether it be three and a half years or seven years, And until then, we are supposed to be, at best, speculative about who it will be. And that we're in doubt even today. Christians argue all over the place, well, who's the the man of sin? Who's the antichrist? Well, it was John F. Kennedy, or it was Saddam Hussein, or, you know, uh, 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 the one that knocked down the trade centers and who, who could it be? The Queen of England? The King of England? Who, who, who could the Antichrist be? There's all kinds of controversy. Listen, God settled that for us 1,800 years ago by giving us just as much detail about who this Antichrist would be, who this great deceiver would be, as he did about who his son would be because God does not want us to be deceived by this great deceiver, by this man of sin. Why would the God of glory, who sacrificed his own son for our redemption, why, what's the background noise? I hear some terrible background noise. I'm sorry, that was Listen, just my, my, my window I had to close here. 
I, I, I want your listeners to know something that ought to make common sense to everyone. Why would the God of glory who sent his only begotten son to, to come and redeem us from our fallen state and to assure us everlasting life and full reconciliation to God, why would he then leave us in doubt about who this great deceiver is? That they all might be damned who love not the truth? What you're really saying, if you believe that we do not know who the Antichrist is, you're really saying that God plays fast and loose and dangerous and careless with the souls for whom his son came to bleed and die to redeem. <clears throat> what God worthy of worship would first save us and then leave us in jeopardy of being deceived? What God, I asked the question again, and I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm trying to spark some understanding in your heart and your mind. What God, worthy of our worship, would first redeem us by his, the blood of his only begotten son and then leave us in jeopardy to this Antichrist? The fact of the matter is he wouldn't, and he didn't. We know just as perfectly well as we know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and that our salvation is guaranteed in his blood without works, but faith only. We know that that same merciful God who would sacrifice all to redeem us would never leave his saints for whom his son bled and died in jeopardy of condemnation for falling prey to this great deceiver called the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn. God would never do such a thing, and to suggest that he does is blasphemy of his great holy name. And do you know that's what they do in all the churches today when they say, we don't know who the Antichrist is? The Antichrist has not yet come, when in fact it's been the papacy for the last 1,800 years, and every Christian before our time not only knew it, but preached against him, prayed against him, defended themselves against him, denounced him as the man of sin, the son of perdition that he is, wrote book after book, libraries of books about this papacy and how he so perfectly fulfills the role of the man of sin and son of perdition as to be an absolute, unquestionable, unarguable certainty. Just as certain as they were that Jesus is the Christ, they were equally as certain that the papacy is the Antichrist. Listen, the identity of the Antichrist is only a mystery in our day. Since about the mid-1800s, Bible-believing Christians throughout history have always known, and their books are still extant. You can read them all. As a matter of fact, and I'm going to give a shameless plug here, I use my program for the last decade it's called Inquisition Update. It's heard every morning on FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and I read verbatim those books. I read and discuss those historical books that prove beyond any doubt who is the Antichrist of the Bible, assuming everybody already understands who Jesus Christ is, the Son of the living God, 
I prove with as much authority as the Bible proves that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the Redeemer of man. I prove just as certainly that the Antichrist of the Bible is the papacy, is, was, and always will be the papacy. And I preach the same thing that every Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian has preached for 1,800 years. <clears throat> now, do you know that these first Thessalonian, these second Thessalonian Christians that we're reading about, they so perfectly understood who this imminent man of sin would be, this son of perdition would be, that they prayed against him by praying for the longevity of the Caesars. And that prayer is still extant in literature in, in, in literature today, and it's included in the text of Henry Grattan Guinness's book, Romanism and the Reformation. They used to pray collectively. The first century Christians used to pray collectively for the longevity, the health of the Caesars. The pagan Roman Caesars who fed Christians to the lions, who cru crucified Christians up and down the roads at night, lighting fires beneath their crosses to the point that the roads could be seen in the clouds above by the fires that lit on the ground below. You could literally trace the map the road leading to Rome, by simply looking up at the base of the clouds, you could see the lights from the fires of the Christians that were burning along the roads to Rome. That's what the Roman Caesars did to Bible-believing Christians. But the first century Christians knew that when the Caesars were taken out of the way, an even greater horror an even greater murderer, a gre an even greater blasphemer, an even greater slaughterer and persecutor of the saints would rise to power. And history records the brutality, the inquisitions, the crusades, and all the multitudes of those who were killed and tortured and maimed at the order of the papacy throughout the entire Christian era, 1,800 years it's all recorded. Fox's Book of Martyrs, a book that was written and dedicated to the memory of multitudes of saints at the hand of the papacy. You can be, and you should be, and you will be eventually fully informed about who this man of sin is. I just hope you're fully informed before Christ returns to condemn him. Because what we find in the world today is called the ecumenical movement. And the ecumenical movement is started by the papacy, and it is a war of conquest against Bible Protestantism, and it is trying to unite anyone and everyone who goes under the name Christian under the authority of the papacy today. The ecumenical movement is all about uniting all Christians under the authority of the papacy. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Can I interrupt you for a second, Tom? Certainly. You were mentioning that prayer, that the Christians were praying for the longevity of the Caesars, mm -hmm. and therefore um, uh, praying that the mystery of iniquity doth already work, but only he that now letteth will let longer, because they saw, mm -hmm. they knew that when the Caesars were gone, what was coming after that would yeah. be even worse, much worse. Yes, and that Paul. is recorded in the book uh, Romanism and the Reformation, and I have that here, and I want to read that so that the people who are listening to this broadcast know that you are not s just saying something, but I have the book here, and I'm going to read this right now to you, if that's okay with you. 
Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Okay. This is on page 195 in the, in the book, Romanism and the Reformation. Tertullian's apology thus describes the habit of the Christian Church of the second century to pray for the security of the Roman Empire in the knowledge that its downfall would bring the catastrophe of the reign of Antichrist and the ruin of the world. So everything that we in Second Thessalonians spoke of today. Addressing the rulers of the Roman Empire, he says, quote, We offer prayer for the safety of our princes to the eternal, the true, the living God, whose favor, beyond all others, they must themselves desire. Thither we lift our eyes, with hands outstretched, because free from sin, with head uncovered, for we have nothing whereof to be ashamed. Finally, without a monitor, because it is from the heart, we supplicate. And without ceasing, for all our emperors we offer prayer. We pray for life prolonged, for security to the empire. With our hands thus stretched out and up to God, rend us with your iron claws. Hang us up on crosses, wrap us in flames. Take our heads from us with the sword, let loose the wild beasts upon us. The very attitude of a Christian praying is the preparation for all punishment. Let this, good rulers, be your work. Ring from us the soul, beseeching God on the Emperor's behalf. Upon the truth of God and devotion to his, uh, to his Salonians, he says, quote, Now ye know what detaineth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does... Or, oh, sorry, this is... Um, this is another part. Uh, upon the truth of God and devotion to his name put the brand of crime. There is also another and a greater necessity for our offering prayer on behalf of the emperors, nay, for the complete stability of the empire and for Roman interests in general. For we know that the mighty shock impending over the whole earth, in fact, the very end of all things threatening dreadful woes, is only retarded by the continued existence of the Roman Empire. We have no desire then to be overtaken by these dire events, and in praying that their coming may be delayed, we are lending our aid to Rome's duration." Unquote. Okay, now do you know what that prayer accomplishes? This is the only context in which the first century Christians, including the Thessalonians to whom Paul spoke directly, privately and in letter, and the second century Christians, this is the only context in which they could name the emperors, the Caesars of the Roman Empire, and about their eventual fall is by a prayer of support and longevity for their safety, their duration, their health, their prosperity, and everything about them. They wanted to pray for the emperor. And don't you know, imagine that the emperor probably most likely appreciated their prayer, even at the time when they were predicting his fall. They let Caesar know through their prayer that the Roman Empire was going to fall and an even greater evil would rise in its place to make the whole world aware of what Paul had spoken privately and very, very carefully in his letter. He was predicting the fall of the pagan Roman Empire and the rise of the man of sin, that great wicked, that great evil in the world that would destroy the whole world and would persecute the saints to the degree that the persecuting Caesars would like would be like Cub Scouts in comparison. I also have another verse in the Bible that makes sure that what you mentioned earlier, Satan is a spirit and therefore he needs a man to accept his spirit. We read in Matthew chapter 4 verse 9 and saith unto him, speaking of the devil, All these things I will give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. 
This is Satan speaking to Jesus Christ who was tempted after his uh, baptism in the river John and uh, dwelt in the wilderness for 40 days without any food, without anything to drink. And the devil tempted Jesus Christ. And he tempted him two times before and in this third time he said, All these things I will give thee. Uh, because he took them, he took Jesus Christ to an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory of all the kingdoms of the world and offered him to give him all these kingdoms if Jesus ju Christ just would fall down and worship him. Jesus Christ, we know, of course, rejected. But Jesus Christ at this moment was a man that could have been accepting the spirit of Satan. Of course, he didn't do that. But there was another man willing to do that. And that man has its, has its foundations in Simon Magus, who we meet in Acts chapter 8, in Rome. And that is today the papacy. Because we know from the book of Revelation that the kings of the earth have, formitted, uh, have committed fornication with the whore that sits in Rome. So it is the papacy that accepted that offer that Jesus Christ, of course, rejected. Another point that I think that proves beyond any doubt that the papacy was, is, and will be until the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Antichrist of the Bible, Tom. Yes, that's absolutely right. And Roman Catholic canon law leaves no doubt that the papacy today and yesterday and the day before, all the way back to the beginning, Roman Catholic canon law demands that every Roman Catholic accept the Pope as if he were Jesus Christ himself, hidden under a veil of flesh. And that the papacy is the Lord of Lords, that is the Bishop of Bishops and head of all the Christian church of whatever denomination. And not only is he Lord of Lords, but he is King of Kings. And the only legitimate government in this world is a king who is a subject of the Holy Roman Pontiff. And if he is not crowned by the king, or not crowned by one of his vicars, one of his uh, uh, priests, he is no government at all and can be removed by any means so long as it does not present a danger to the Roman Catholic Church. This is Roman Catholic canon law. It is written in the canons of the laws of the Roman Catholic Church. So the papacy stands head and shoulders above every government in this world. Only those who have sworn their allegiance to serve and obey the papacy are allowed to continue in government. And those governments which do not accept the authority of the papacy and rule at his behest are subject of regime change. Yeah, yeah that's the difference between de facto and de jure governments, right? Yep. A de facto government is a government in fact, but it is not a papal government. And it may be, gov it may be removed at the whim of the papacy by whatever means at his disposal at any time that it will benefit the papacy and not bring the Roman Catholic Church into condemnation. All right? Now, a de jure government is a government that is crowned by the papacy, is totally controlled and subservient by the papacy. So whenever you hear anyone talking in the news about a de jure versus a, a de facto government, now you know the true definition of it, and that's the, what they mean to say. When they talk about a de facto government, that is a government that is subject to regime change at any time. A de jure government is a anti-Christ government. It's a government of the man of sin, the son of perdition. Look, the papacy can't not single-handedly govern the whole world. He has to have governments that will serve him and pass as law civil laws that are commensurate with, if not perfectly verbatim, Roman Catholic canon law. Okay? 
Roman Catholic canon law is written so that the kings of the earth will know what laws to implement and to enforce in their own com- in their own countries. And this has been revealed long, long ago by Protestant and Christian writers throughout history. Their books are still extant, and I read those books and explain those books verbatim on my program, Inquisition Update. So I know this is true, okay? I know this is true for a certainty. And you cannot believe the lies that are taught in the churches today. Do you know who they tell us is the restrainer that hold, that's withholding the rise of their phony future antichrist? They say the Holy Spirit's going to be taken out of the way. How ridiculous when the Bible plainly says that the Spirit of God brooded over the waters before the world even was. Imagine they would convince us that the Holy Spirit is ever going to be taken out of this world. Well, the point is, Tom, if you took the Holy Spirit out of this world, this world would be totally under control of Satan and would be doomed to absolutely destruction within a week, I think. If that is the case, if that is the case that the world would ever fall completely into the hands of Satan, then why are we called joint, joint heirs with Christ and that the earth will become the kingdom of our God? That's right. The Holy Spirit's never going to be taken out of the world. And this ridiculous cockamamie lie that they preach from the pulpits of the churches today is straight from the pit. It's straight from the Pope. Yeah, that's why it says in verse 10, where we have to continue, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Yep. And for this cause... God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, what is what the is lie? This strong delusion. What is huh? this strong delusion? What is this lie? The strong delusion is called futurism. Yes, the the the, the strong delusion is what is taught in all the churches today that the antichrist is yet future. That's right. I hear a gasp all over your listening audience. But it's true. That strong delusion, that lie, which God sends to those who will be damned, who believe not the truth but lies and have pleasure in this unrighteousness is futurism. The idea that the man of sin has not yet been revealed in the world. And therefore, it cannot be the papacy because the papacy has existed for nearly 1,800 years all throughout the Christian era. What this literally says is the pope is not the Antichrist. That is the strong delusion. That is the lie that is taught by futurist pastors and priesters all over this world. When every Christian before about the middle 1800s were perfectly correct in their assertion, their indefragable assertion that the papacy is, was, and always will be the beast, the the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist, the little horn. The Bible describes him by various different names, all fitting the same office. From the first pope through all of his successors throughout the Christian era, It is, was, and always will be the papacy. Every Bible-believing Christian has known it for 1,800 years, and it's only since the middle 1800s that Christians have been deceived. All deceivableness of unrighteousness, 
the great and strong delusion sent by God to damn those who love not the truth is that the papacy is not the Antichrist. And that's what's taught in all the churches today. You've got to ask yourself, you've got to ask yourself, why in the world would I stay in any so-called Christian church that does not acknowledge that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, just as Jesus is, was, and always will be the Christ? Well, because they are not listening to verse 3. Let no man deceive you. That's right. Because this great delusion that God sends can only be because he says that they should believe a lie. Now God is not capable of lying. So who is the author of that lie? Well I'd like to say the one who is the father of lies, Satan. Yep. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness because they want to be deceived by man because they love to listen to man. And they just don't do the effort to listen to God. Now I'd to like to ask I'd word. like to ask another question. Please. Who is the author of futurism? History records that it's the papacy. You see, all throughout the Christian era, ever since the very beginning of the rise of the papacy, there were among God's people those who were just as wise as the Thessalonians, who knew very well that that power, which would come to power after the fall of the Caesars, was the man of sin, the son of perdition. And they preached it everywhere they went. And even Roman Catholics within the Roman Catholic Church read the scriptures, even in their corrupted Bible, and they came to the same conclusion. Why, this man of sin, it can only be the papacy. There's, there's, there's just no other candidate. There's nothing in the world that fu can fulfill this prophecy or all of these prophecies together but the papacy itself. And Roman Catholics de denounced the papacy as the Antichrist, the man of sin and the son of perdition. And this was a constant accusation among Roman Catholics within the Roman Catholic Church and Rome had to find a way to deal with it so what they did was created alternative interpretations of those prophecies which the only thing they could do was either uh, for uh, would either cast the onus of Antichrist onto someone in the distant past like one of the Roman Caesars Caligula or Nero, or even as ridiculously as Alexander the Great from the Grecian Roman uh, the Grecian Empire, either that or cast the onus of Antichrist onto the distant future, just before Christ's return. And what do both of those false interpretations of Bible prophecy accomplish? They to take away the spotlight of the papacy. As That's the right. That's right. And the papacy authored both what is known today as preterism, which say the Antichrist has already come centuries and centuries ago before the, role, before the fall of the pagan Roman Empire. It was Emperor Nero or Caligula, one or the other, take your pick, <coughs> and that the Holy Roman Pope replaced them. So this is the kingdom of God that we're living in now. Okay. And then, if that doesn't serve you, if you choose not to believe that lie, well, then you can believe the other lie, the one that is almost universally believed in the churches today. With almost no exception at all, they all believe that the Antichrist is a future individual that comes just before Christ returns, either three and a half years or seven years, depending on which, whether you're premillennial or post-whatever, and that... He will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And both of them accomplish the same thing. The papacy is perfectly exonerated. What you just wanted to say, Tom, was uh, pre-tribulation rapture yeah, or pre post-tribulation post rapture, post three and a half mid, or seven years. Yeah. Or mid-tribulation, it's all a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, I'm, I'm just correcting straight you because you said pit. millennial, so that straight, the people understand this correctly. Straight from the pit. Yep. Is what they teach in all the churches today, almost without exception. 
Yeah, and in this case, Tom, the truth is in the middle. The truth is right smack dab in the middle. It's the same thing that was believed, preached, and taught in writing by all the saints throughout history. Yeah, it is not preterism in the past. It is not futurism in the future. It's in the middle historicism, biblical right. historicism. Yeah. That's historicism is, is, is the word we use to describe the predominant belief, teaching, and assertion of every Bible-believing Christian throughout history. They saw in history the rise of the man of sin right after the, res the restrainer was taken out of the way, right after the Roman Caesars were taken out of the way. They saw the rise of the man of sin. They knew precisely who he was. There was no other candidate so that no one could be deceived. Remember, it's just as important for us to know who the Antichrist is as it is important for us to know who the Christ is. God does not play fast and loose with the souls for whom he sent his son to bleed and die to redeem. He did not leave his saints clueless as to who this man of sin, this great Antichrist, would be. He predicted his rise right after the fall of the Caesar so that none of us would be deceived. He cares for us. He loves us enough to send his only begotten son. Why would he leave us clueless as to who this deceiver is and what his deceptions would be? A very but important that's, that's point. But that's what they would have you believe in all the churches today, almost without exception. They very blaspheme the name of God when they suggest that we do not know and should not know and cannot know who the Antichrist is when every Christian before us knew precisely who he was. They were not deceived by him. They preached Jesus, and they preached against the Antichrist so that none of them would be deceived by him. That's a very important point <clears throat> you were just making there. And the point so, that I want to make about historicism, Tom, is prophecy in the Bible is history written in advance. So when we speak about historicism, we speak about the history and the historicism of the Bible. So we know that the people who were living even before things happened could know this, like the Thessalonians, as Paul taught them when he said, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? historicism he told them the prophecy that would go that would come so he told them history in advance and we today living in 2018 have the possibility to look even back at the time and look at the fulfilled prophecy all throughout the last 2000 years and see how that prophecy has fulfilled itself historicism that's why history is so important and that is why history is not taught in our schools and universities anymore well they've I removed mean, they've removed that history from all the libraries from the yeah, churches from the universities just, from the colleges from the high schools and the grade schools and do you know what they read before all of this attack against this history was the writings of the protestants well just when you read uh, uh tapa Sorsi's book rulers of evil he makes the point that in 1914 90 percent of the american colleges in the United States had a obligatory history course. In 1934, uh, 1939 and in 1964 only 50% of the universities had an obligatory history course. And by 1996 only one of 50 universities or colleges had a obligatory history course. This is how they fade out the knowledge of the generation from generation to generation within three generations from 1914 to 1990 80 years they went from 90 percent of obligatory um, history courses in colleges to one out of 50 schools and that's because of course we have the Jesuits the minions of Satan and the military arm of the Roman Catholic Church controlling the educational world all uh, the education all over the world yeah well i would have thought much more of f tupper saucy in his book rulers of evil had he told us flat out what we all should know never in the history of this country has the educational system told us 
of the historicist belief of Bible Protestants all throughout history, from the first century to the last. Not a word was mentioned about that. Never in the history of this country has the educational system of this country ever told the Protestant truth. But that's it's not never America, been. Tom. It's never been on the curriculum. That's not unique to America. We it was designed to be forgotten long, long ago, long before this country was ever a nation. Yeah, that's right. That goes back to the um, Medici learning the Jesuits introduced, the learning against learning, the teaching of Gnosticism against the teaching of the Bible. And that was the very first thing they kept But we're talking about with. history. You yeah, yeah. mentioned it in the very beginning that Bible prophecy is just history foretold. Yeah, exactly. Now, without an accurate, correct, and true knowledge of history, there's absolutely no way for a man to know whether a certain prophecy of the Bible has been fulfilled. The only way in the world there is to know what prophecies have been fulfilled and what prophecies have not been fulfilled is a, is a, is a, is a correct record of history. If God prophesies something to happen, history foretold, then history will be the testimony of its fulfillment. And no other where can you get that assurance. If it's not recorded in history, it is not fulfilled. Now, interestingly, if the churches all teach a future Antichrist that has not yet come in history, then you can speculate till the cows come home and you'll most likely be incorrect, right? But if you're of the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy and you know that if God prophesies something to happen, its fulfillment will be recorded in history. And once it is recorded in history, it is fulfilled. And what happens when we recognize that the true understanding of history leaves no room for doubt that the man of sin, the son of perdition, rose precisely at the fall of the pagan Roman Empire and was manifest in the papacy, and that the papacy has been drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus for 1,800 years, and we have documented record of it, voluminous documented record of it, by as many authors as there are martyrs of Jesus. It is fulfilled in history. Don't look in the future for a future Antichrist, because if you have, you have been deceived. You are a holder of that strong delusion. You believe a lie, and you might be damned if you continue in that lie and do not believe the truth. And the truth is what Paul prophesied. If any man comes to deceive you and says that the, the day of the Lord is at hand, he is a liar, because what must first happen before Christ returns, the day of the Lord, is that there be a great falling away from the faith, and that the man of sin should be revealed, and the only thing that is preventing either of those is the Caesars in Rome, and when they're taken out of the way, the great apostasy will result immediately into the rise of the great apostate, the great counterfeit Christ. And listen, when you fully understand what I've just told you, and that you finally come to the realization that there is no candidate in the world, in world history, that can fulfill that prophecy but the papacy, you come to a stark realization that it's the truth, that it's the verifiable historical truth, that there's no question about it, that God does not play fast and loose with the souls of the, of the souls that his Christ came to bleed and died for, that he wanted us just as certainly to know who the Antichrist is as he did. He wanted us to know who his Christ was and that he is fulfilled in history and he's still in power today deceiving, 
deceiving with all power and signs and lying wonders with works and not grace, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, King of kings and Lord of lords, counterfeit though he may be, the kings of the earth obey him and put his Roman Catholic canon law on the registers of their own civil law and make us all, without our knowledge or consent, subjects of the holy Roman pontiff. The whole world is literally deceived, just like the Bible says, and no greater place are they deceived but in the churches today of every denomination. Yeah, and that's why you have the call of God in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. That's right. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. Mm -hmm. Let me just quote this, chapter 18, verse 4. Um, just open this here. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. All right, who is the her that he's talking about? The false bride of Christ. The yep. false bride of Christ. And that is the Roman Catholic Church and all of her harlot daughters. Those churches which proceeded from between her knees. That is the Protestant churches. They knew the truth 500 years ago. Now they have recanted. Now they are ecumenically reuniting with the Roman Catholic Church, and they're leading us all to perdition, almost without exception. I can't name you a denomination of any so-called Protestant or evangelical church that doesn't in some form or fashion teach the historic, or rather the futurist, interpretation of Bible prophecy and cast the onus of Antichrist onto a distant future individual and does not acknowledge what every Christian throughout history prior to the 1850s denounced as the Antichrist, the papacy. You Look, when you comprehend the apostasy that is Christianity today, you have to wonder why God has not returned and put a stop to this apostasy. And I'm reminded again of Lucifer's false prophecy. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will be like the Most High. And God's answer is, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the side of the pit he did not deny that satan would not do as he said but only after he does what he says he will be brought down to the sides of the pit and that will happen only when christ returns until then Antichrist has ruled and reigned in this world over all of Christianity and over all the kings of the earth, and we know who he is, and all the saints prior to about the middle 1800s have known who he was, and they were not deceived, and neither are we. We have not fallen to the strong delusion. We do not believe the lie. And what is that lie? That the papacy is the vicar or the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and that it is God himself hidden under a veil of flesh who sits in the temple of God, who says that he is God. No one has made that claim any time in history but the papacy, and they have made that claim all throughout history for 1,800 years. Now listen, if you come away from this program and you still are not sure who the Antichrist is, just as certain as I am, just as certain as Yerk is, and just as certain as all Christians throughout history were, 
then I implore you, I beseech you from the marrow of my bones to read the writings of the Protestant reformers and the writings of all true Bible-believing Christians throughout history. Or simply tune into Inquisition Update every morning on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and listen to Inquisition Update as I read for you and explain for you their very words. And if you choose not to do that, at least, at least, go to the Internet, go to Google or any other search engine and type in the title Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. And he will show you what was believed by all Bible-believing Christians throughout history. He will perfectly explain Daniel's prophecies. He will perfectly explain Paul's prophecies and his teachings. He will perfectly explain John's beliefs and teachings in the, in the apocalypse, in the, in, the, in the book of Revelation. And after all that, you don't need Tom Fress or Inquisition Update or Yerk or Joggler 66. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In Jesus' name, let you be free in Jesus. Let you be free from the curse and the lie and the strong delusion of Antichrist in Rome. God grant it today in Jesus' name. Come out of the apostate Christian churches and be free. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Exalt his name together. Let's magnify the Lord so that he is seen more clearly. Psalm 34, verse 3. Let's exalt his name together by living pure and holy. Psalm 34. Oh, 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 oh,